afternoon once again, everyone who might be tuned in to us, friends, visitors, loved ones, members. Survival skills. Survival skill training was a hobby of mine a few years back. I would enjoy preparing for a few backpacking trips on the Appalachian Trail and the in the uh, mountains of southern Ohio and various places. That, it was just a hobby I enjoyed doing some years back. I also had the opportunity of teaching survival skill training, simple classes, to our teen youth camps for a number of years. And I, I enjoyed it very much. It was always a fun activity, especially when we got to the part about building campfires and, and uh, using flint and, and, uh, and steel and uh, starting, you know, how to build a, the proper campfire that would, uh, with the, the kindling and the tinder and building it up. Kids just loved it. They ate it up. I did too. So when needed, survival skills usually break down into what we would learn as five priorities or a hierarchy of priorities. In wilderness skills classes, students were taught these five priorities of survival, and they were given in small groups. We'd break them into small groups and give them a scenario to talk over for about five minutes. And they would be given a certain little bag of, of components of some items that might be frivolous items and might be extremely valuable for people that might be in, stranded somewhere. Some cases, it would give them a snow-covered mountain where you're lost and all the roads and trails are covered with snow. and You have no way of knowing how you got there or where to get out. Another possible scenario, you're adrift at sea with your group or your family and your motor has stopped or your sail is torn off or something. Or you're lost in the Mojave Desert in California and your car is broken down and you are so far away from civilization. What do you do in those situations? And so anyway, those were kind of fun things. The top priority in survival classes began with each person taking inventory on how the health and well-being of each person in your party is. Is everyone safe? Is anyone injured? Are there any broken legs or injuries? Or, or, or is there uh, uh, just an imminent danger of falling into a river or something? You know, those would be the first things you ask. What is the immediate physical well-being of each person in your group? Second item of, of priority would be shelter. You're going to be there for a night or two or three. What do you do for shelter? Do you build yourself a lean-to shelter? Do you uh, find uh, some way to protect yourself from the blizzard, ice-cold winds, or the rain, or the snow, or the blazing sun? Even your clothing acts as shelter, and the shoes on your feet, so we talk about that. The fire that you can start is something that is going to offer you some uh, extremely important psychological comfort if you are stranded somewhere out in the wilderness. Lighting a fire, uh, people that study this say, is one of the most comforting things. If you've got a fire going and you're stranded in, in the wilderness uh, somewhere, and uh, that, that just gives you a lot of psychological comfort. Third would be a need for sustenance. Food and water, you start discussing that. How many days do you think we'll be here before someone finds us? What are we going to do about fresh water? Water and then food in that order. Fourth priority would be, do you have a method of sending signals? Let's say you're stuck in one spot. Can you get a signal out? There are many, many different ways of uh, putting out signals, from markers on a trail to uh, pieces of strap, uh, strips of your clothing hanging on trees so that search and rescue people can come find you. Another way is possibly smoke and, and, uh, and, and large markers that can be seen from a helicopter overhead. Numerous things you can do to teach uh, people about distress calls and markers for signaling. And then finally, you have a decision with your team that's safe to travel. Nobody's going to find us in this remote spot. We're going to have to venture out. We've counted the costs. We've calculated what we can do and how far we can go. Everyone's health. <clears throat> can we travel to safety or, or, or uh, help? So in those five priorities, S, 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 N, 
SSSSN would stand for a method of safety, of shelter, of sustenance, of signaling and navigation. Now different teachers of survival skills use different techniques and that was just one that we would, we would work with. Now, having given you all that stuff about survival training, this message is really about a spiritual survival skill. You knew that, right? You knew that all along. It is a survival skill called discernment. Discernment is a spiritual survival skill. You and I have been offered gifts and resources to become spiritually minded, <clears throat> to have the very mind of Jesus Christ in us, and exercising that mind of Christ, especially as we progress in this period of time in history toward the end of this age, as Satan applies more and more cunning and strategies to thwart and to distract and disturb God's people, if it were possible, even the elect of God. These are things that Jesus Christ warned in the end of the age. Spiritual discernment is a life-saving tool. It can be likened to a wilderness, physical wilderness, survival skill. So today I'd like to speak on four steps on growing in spiritual discernment. The title is simply, Growing in Discernment. Growing in Discernment. So what is discernment? Let's break it down by definition. This is probably the best definition I've heard yet. It was by a very influential English Protestant minister named Charles Spurgeon. It was long ago. He said once, discernment is not a matter of simply telling the difference between right and wrong. Rather, it is telling the dis difference between right and almost right. I really thought about that definition a good bit. In my opinion, it is one of the best definitions because it shows the subtleties that are not always obvious in life, gray areas in life, the difference between right and not so right. A couple other definitions, the Old Testament uh, word uh, from the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew lexicon of biblical words explains, one of the Hebrew words that are used, that are tra it is um, translated into the English word discern, also means understand, consider, or perceive. That comes from a Hebrew word. In the New Testament, a Greek word from the Thayer's Greek lexicon, uh, the Greek word translated into English discerning is diakresis. Diakresis means a distinguishing, a discerning, or a judging. Merriam-Webster definition gives discernment this. It is the quality of being able to grasp and comprehend the obscure. <clears throat> it is the power to see, <clears throat> excuse me, what is not evident to the average mind. It is the ability to distinguish and select what is true or appropriate or excellent. Discernment stresses accuracy, as in accuracy, accurately, distinguishing motives and attitudes and sensing uh, uh, other people's character. Pardon me for a second. <clears throat> okay, just checking. It's, it's just that allergy time, yes. All right, I've gotten a signal that someone's gonna bring me some water. It's just that pollen season. So I know some of you in this room are already having to face some spring pollens. <clears throat> I'll continue going. Throughout the Bible, we see the importance of distinguishing between good and evil, of course, and the gray areas of good and not so good. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there are gray areas about what is right and wholesome and good and what is not so good. Pardon me. Please turn to 1 Kings 3 and verse 5 with me. In the cases where we need to grow in discernment, there's an excellent example on what Solomon did early, very early 
at the start of his reign over Israel. 1 Kings 3 and verse 5. As you're turning, after the death of his father David, Solomon was set to be the next king of Israel. He knew he needed divine help. This is what God looked at and appreciated. It was like Saul when he was young. The prophet Samuel said to Saul, Saul, when you were young and you were small in your own eyes, God could work with you. But you, that all changed later in life for Saul and he, he drifted away from God and God rejected him as king. So Samuel, I mean, uh, Solomon's going to have to learn something about this as well. So in verse 5, it starts the story. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And then skip to verses 7 through 9 with me. 1 Kings 3, verses 7 through 9. Solomon responded, Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out and come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. You could see his feeling of being overwhelmed by this magnitude of responsibility laid on his shoulders when King David died. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? You see what he prayed for. Skip to verse 12 here. Here, God is so pleased with Solomon's uh, request that he grants his request. I've done according to your words, God says. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you nor shall any like you ever arise like you after this. So it was an astounding part of Israel's history that God would grant an enormous amount of wisdom and understanding to one man who would be king of Israel. And he said no one else would ever have the same. Of course, Jesus Christ himself would be the one exception, being that he was God in the flesh. But... Solomon, for a human king, nobody else before or after him would share the same amazing wisdom. What did Solomon earn, learn, uh, learn early in his reign over Israel? Well, he learned to ask for discernment. This is a critical time as any in history for God's people. As critical as any time in history. Now, you notice I don't use the... the uh, saying that this is the most critical time? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is as critical time as any time in God's people to ask for discernment in your personal life. Step one of the four steps. First is to ask for discernment. Ask for it in prayer. Let's hold our place in 1 Kings. I'm going to put a marker in my Bible here and turn to Proverbs 2 and verse 3. Proverbs 2 and verse 3. Proverbs 2 and verses 3 through 7. Solomon is inspired to write here that we need to be asking earnestly for this discernment. Just as he did when David handed over his leadership to his young son, Solomon. Verse three, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. You notice the emphasis, the urgency, the focus is on cry out for discernment. Lift up your voice for understanding. And here, Solomon is a wonderful example of one who faithfully asks for an understanding heart. 
which is, again, to say discerning heart. And we see how God responded so readily to that request. When we can't distinguish between good and evil, because, again, there are many gray areas from our day-to-day lives that we're sometimes wishing we had a little more clarity, a little more information, a little more that we could make a decision on, uh, when we can't always discern the motives of others, whether they're helpful or they're sincere or not, the first place to go is, of course, to God in prayer. It's first place to go is to God in prayer. Psalm 119, verse 66, I won't turn, but it's a reference. Psalm 119, verse 66, the psalmist here prays to God, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. The New American Standard Bible puts that this way, teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Teach me good discernment and knowledge. The psalmist is praying the same thing. James 1 verse 5, another reference. James 1 verse 5, if any of us lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally or generously without reproach and it will be given him. That's as sure a promise as anything. Ask of God for wisdom. He gives it. He pours it out generously. He will not hold back. And that promise is, is, is sincere. If you want it, if you desire it, ask for it. Because an abundant life and a secure life requires spiritual discernment. So step number one out of the four today was uh, to acquire spiritual discernment is to ask for it in prayer. What happened to Solomon later in life? What happened to his understanding heart and his discernment that he had prayed for and that God poured out more than any other human being on earth? At the start of his role as king over Israel, we know he initially was granted tremendous gifts of understanding, that is to say, discernment. But when we look at Solomon's gradual decline in discernment and good judgment, you see the things he did. Uh, holding our place in Proverbs, we'll go back to 1 Kings, now chapter 11 and verse 4. This takes us toward the end of the story, end of his life. We see what he's done with his life. I mean, it doesn't go into all the detail that you can see in Ecclesiastes, but you see here some of the things that God was displeased with. 1 Kings 11, verses 4 through 6. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Now, the discussion goes further into some of the huge errors that Solomon made, but to sum it up, his heart was turned away from God. He strayed into building palaces to false gods to appease his many wives, and, and, and he, just, uh, he, he loved women, it says, and he had hundreds and hundreds, over a thousand wives, and hundreds of, of half or, or um, we call concubines in the Bible are, are, are um, wives without all the same legal rights as the other wives had, but his heart was turned away, and it led to many sorrows for him and many sorrows for other people in Israel who suffered under his harsh taxation and his severe treatment and his conscripted labor to build all these buildings and his building projects. His pet building projects took many people away from home and family to build in those years. Now, I won't go into the final outcome of Solomon. We think that possibly he repented late in life. Um, you kind of get that 
gather, gather that from the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, but this much we see that when he strayed from God, he lost his discernment. You see, the human mind is equipped and designed by God with a spirit entity which separates us from all the other living things on earth. No other living thing on earth has the same kind of intellect as a human being. Job 32 verse 8 is one of those classic scriptures that I won't turn to, but Job 32 verse 8, it's one of the most fundamental truths about this spirit in man. Elihu, he's the youngest of Job's friends who came to visit him during Job's long-suffering trial. He says, but there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. That short passage is one of the things that Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong was uh, found was profound understanding as to how God's Holy Spirit works with a human spirit, connects together to impart spiritual knowledge. But without that, we have intellect still. We have intellect. It's this spirit of, in man that imparts the ability to think and reason like a human being. It also provides for an initial awareness of God. No, no other animal in the animal kingdom can do that, it has a concept of a God, where human beings with just a spirit in man can do that. Now, since most in this room have either been called or are in the process of being called, it gives us the ability to advance into deeper and deeper understanding of spiritual things, which the carnal mind cannot fully discern. This leads us to step number two out of four on acquiring discernment. Step number two is learning what God's will is, studying what God's will is, tapping into his spiritual knowledge. Go back with me, if you would, to Proverbs 15 and verse 14. Proverbs 15 and verse 14. We're told here, <clears throat> the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of foo fools feeds on foolishness. Again, the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge. Now, knowledge, uh, the emphasis is usually on spiritual knowledge when you see these passages. The NIV puts it this way, the discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. Then over to Proverbs 19, verse 2. Proverbs 19, verse 2. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he sins who hastens with his feet. The NIV is actually much clearer. The New International Version says this. It's not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty and miss the way. This is saying, in effect, that the, the gift of discernment tempers us. It modifies our, um, our reactions to things in life. It helps us to stay settled in God and rest and hope in God. Be still in God, if you will. Not acting hastily in situations where we don't have either most of the facts or we haven't had enough time to process what's going on in certain situations, to be able to make good, sound judgments and not careless, reckless ones. Discernment helps us in those areas. So we learn that good judgment or understanding or discernment, very interchangeable, help us to act very properly and to draw the right conclusions in situations in life Clearly, we need to learn to judge righteous judgment, and some of that comes down to gathering as many facts as we can to understand a situation. But then discernment also comes to play. I won't turn, but Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Paul says this to the brethren, Ephesians 5 verse 8. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. And then verse 15, he says, see that you walk circumspectly, meaning as we go through life, we watch our back, we look on all sides, 
We don't just go blindly forward. He says, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I won't turn, but also in Acts 17, verse 11, a situation here, I'll paraphrase, Acts 17, verse 11, talks about when Paul and Silas uh, went to Berea. When they arrived, they went into a synagogue of the Jews, and they were impressed with the people of Berea, the Christians in Berea. He says, they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so, the things that they were being taught, the things about Jesus Christ and about the gospel. They were more fair-minded and they listened more readily than in any number of other locations where they had been. Discernment is also a gift of God. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 helps point this out. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. Discernment is a gift from God. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 here were told that there are various gifts in the Bible. There are spiritual gifts. There is also discernment of various things in the Bible. Discernment of spirits, discernment of attitudes and actions, discernment of the times we're living in, in this day and age. So how can we acquire this gift as a gift of discernment? Well, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 2 says, But it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And here is where Paul is quoting Isaiah 64, verse 4. He gets that straight from Isaiah 64, verse 4. And then verse 10, Paul adds this. He says, but God has revealed them to us through his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The Spirit searches all things is, again, one of those very broad statements. What is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about all things as in the things now discerned through the Holy Spirit that could not be discerned humanly beforehand. That's a way of interpreting that, all things. Things that are now discernible through having the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, Paul continues. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God in him. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Again, this is a part of the gifting of discernment. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing Spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, Paul continues. He says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to the natural or the carnal mind, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I'm sorry, because they are spiritually discerned. Again, without the help of God's Holy Spirit, humanity is only able to understand a certain level of spiritual things. Now, having said that, four and five and six-year-old children can learn and understand some pretty remarkable spiritual concepts appropriate for their age. They can. And a lot of that we come to understand is through the, um, through the conversion of their parents, that children of converted parents have special opportunities that other children of the world just don't have. So now, adding to the intellect, to the spirit in man, in the carnal mind, God can now impart his mind to us as well to give us spiritual insight that we couldn't have before. 
Let's continue, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 15 and 16. Here Paul continues on what happens when a spirit-led person is able to discern spiritual things. Verse 15, he who is spiritual judges all things. There's that all things term again. All things that Paul used in verse 8 a moment ago. Depicting all the spiritual things God reveals to a spirit-led person person. He who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Now that verse by itself is puzzling. It's a difficult verse without some explanation. In your Bibles, you might have margins that offer alternate words to the two times you see judges or judged. Uh, The Greek word is anakrino, It can also mean scrutinized or examined or discerned. Let's read it again. I'm going to change the words now. Verse 15. But he who is spiritual discerns all spiritual things, yet he himself is rightly discerned by no one. What that can mean is that a person who is spirit-led by God's Holy Spirit, a person that doesn't have that gift can't understand the same motives, the same reactions, the same mindset, the same heart as the person with God's Holy Spirit. That's what that can mean. And then so it continues, it really means a person without the working of the Holy Spirit cannot discern what's happening in the heart and mind of a person who has God's Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. Paul is concluding the matter that those that are spirit-led have Jesus Christ's mind in them. That describes having the Holy Spirit working in us or with us and growing in spiritual maturity. So step two in our search for discernment is to search out and learn God's will and to recognize that discernment is a gift for the asking is a gift for the asking. Once we recognize that spiritual discernment is a gift, then we should take the next step, step three out of four. Step three, we are instructed to ask for more of God's Holy Spirit. And if that's not an accurate way of putting it, ask for God's Holy Spirit is literally what it says. And we'll read the passage if we turn to Luke 11 verse 9. Luke 11, verse 9. This is step three. We're to ask for the Holy Spirit. Luke 11 and verse 9. Here, as you're turning, Jesus said in this context about asking God for a gift that only he can give. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Verse 10, for everyone who asks received, receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone instead of bread? If he asks for a fish, is a father going to give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, is he going to be given a scorpion by a loving father? Well, these are rhetorical questions that have Uh, that sound absurd, don't they? They're meant to be absurd. Verse 13, if you then, being evil or carnal-minded, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If that's not a clear, demonstrable statement that ask for God's Holy Spirit, then nothing is. Ask for the Spirit. Paul said to Timothy, I won't turn, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. Paul said to his young charge, Timothy, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This helps enhance, embellish, and enrich our spiritual knowledge, understanding, and discernment. Now there is the extraordinary gift concept or aspect of the Holy Spirit that can convey 
manifestation gifts, as they're often called. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is, is one of the major lists about manifestation gifts. I won't turn there, but it says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, these are the diversities of gifts, the various gifts that God gives to people that he's giving his Holy Spirit to. He says it's the very same spirit. Verse 10 says to another he'll give the working of miracles, to another person prophecy, another person discerning of spirits. And then he goes on with several others. This is one of the more interesting ones to me, the gift of discerning of spirits. So various gifts of the Holy Spirit are given in the church, the true church, to enhance the church body, to help the church body help one another and uplift and encourage and build up each other. Verse 10, when it says one of the gifts is that of discerning spirits, the NIV says to another distinguishing between spirits, and the Phillips translation, I like this too, it says to another he gives the ability to discriminate in spiritual matters. The ability to discriminate in spiritual matters. I won't turn, but Matthew 24, verse 4, there's a warning that, uh, of what would be a growing deception at the end of this age. Globally, everywhere. Jesus answered and said, Matthew 24, verse 4, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. That's part of the Olivet Prophecy, warning of, of uh, the, the religious error and false teachers that will come at the end of the age and increase at the end of the age. How are we to take heed? How are we to guard ourselves from this? Well, it takes spiritual discernment. Please turn to 1 John 4, verse 1. 1 John 4, verse 1 helps us with this. First John 4, verse 1. Here the Apostle John is addressing the membership in this letter. And as part of developing spiritual discernment against wrong spirits, he's teaching them to be on their guard. He says, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every, uh, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Now we know that 2,000 years ago when this was written, there was a little more black and white between those two concepts and people that rejected the Messiahship and the divinity of Jesus Christ, the fact that he died and was raised back to life. It's a little more blurry now when, G when Satan has had all this time to craft up new strategies and, and to work within false teachers who accept that, but yet they're false teachers. And so at the time this was written, that was probably a much more distinguishable difference between those who were faithful and those who did not believe the truth. The, uh, today's English Bible puts it this way. 1 John 4 and verse 1. My dear friends, do not believe all who claim to have the Spirit, but test them to find out if the Spirit they have comes from God. For many false prophets have gone out everywhere. Learning who really has the Spirit of God, if they say they do, do they really? It's an interesting concept. Again, I say that discernment is a spiritual survival skill. Paul said in Romans 16, verse 9, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. That again was Romans 16, verse 9. So step three was to ask for the Holy Spirit in order to grow in this gift of discernment. Now, discernment, as we just saw, is a gift from God, but it is also a skill. It's not a permanent gift, though. It's not permanent any more than it was with King Saul or King Solomon. 
they lost their discernment. We could lose the power of discernment by drifting away from following God. Let's look at how skill development is mentioned in the book of Hebrews 5 and verse 12 in this context. Hebrews 5 verse 12, how discernment is a skill to be developed. Hebrews 5 verse 12 Here the author tells us spiritual maturity and spiritual discernment are the result of use, regular exercise, regular use of the word of righteousness. Now the author of Hebrews, many of us in the church will uh, pretty much attribute it to the Apostle Paul, but there's no, there's no uh, heading on the letter. There's no no one has addressed the book of Hebrews, so you'll often hear me say the author of Hebrews, just because we, re- we really don't know for sure. But scholars, Bible scholars, feel like this was a very deeply theological letter written between 65 and possibly getting close to 70 AD, but very likely before the Roman army came in and destroyed Jerusalem and burned down the temple, and the Jews lost their economy, they lost their their uh, nationhood, they scattered, they, uh, they, they lost their religious center. And so probably before that, by the way it's written, but a good 35 years or so after Christ's crucifixion, the letter of the Hebrews, uh, to the Hebrews was written to a church community that needed to be encouraged to continue growing spiritually through difficult times. It appears they'd already gone through a Roman period of persecution and there was another one coming. And um, secular history shows they're, they're between sandwiched between that time were two Roman persecution periods. And so he's saying here also that the brethren that are receiving this letter should have been a little more mature spiritually than they were. It says in verses 12 through 14, we're in Hebrews 5, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. He's just a mere child spiritually. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Having their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So step four, we can hear, we can see here that constant use and exercise is necessary in order to develop this gift into a skill. Discernment is a skill that needs to be developed. And since it's a gift, it's, it's in a sense like a natural gift given to every human being on earth. When we're born, we see little children, all of us parents and grandparents love to watch the development of natural ability and talent in our children and grandchildren. We love to see this, and it's fascinating. You put a child in front of certain uh, things and you see if they gravitate toward it or they don't. And given some time, some encouragement, some resources, and some latitude, we see little children flourish in things where their talents can be developed into skills, skills of all kinds, blossoming into some of the highest level of academic achievement, or sports achievement, or writing, or music, or art, or technology, or some craft. And watching children just gravitate towards something like that is just a wonderful thing to see. God is also delighted in watching you and me develop a gift of discernment into a finely honed skill. Our Heavenly Father in Heaven looks at us like children and want to see us, He wants to see us mature in the same way and develop a skill preparing us for sonship in service and in leadership for eternity. So God looks at us the same way as we anticipate watching children and grandchildren grow in some talent and turn it into a skill for the rest of their lives. 
So exercising a gift is what develops it into a skill in any endeavor in life. Using the natural gift of artistry. Parents will start seeing that at age two and three and four when you put a pen or a crayon in the hand of a child. It develops the skillful artist. Using the natural gift of singing develops into a skillful singer. The natural physical talent that develops the athlete. You see these things and the same thing occurs with discernment. If you hold your place in Hebrews and turn with me to Philippians 1 verse 9, Paul has a prayer here. Paul has a prayer, which I thought really fits well. Philippians 1 and verse 9. Paul is praying for the brethren in this letter to the brethren at Philippi that their agape love would continue to grow along with their spiritual discernment together. Now, remember, agape love can also be translated in the King James Bible as affection, benevolence, charity, that kind of love. And so verse 9, and this I pray, Paul says, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment and all discernment, that you may approve the things which are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So Paul says he's praying, and he writes down this pray, prayer for the brethren to grow in this agape love, this charity and this affection toward one another, and their spiritual discernment at the same time, that they may approve the things which are Excellent. Then uh, today's English Bible, same verse. This is my prayer for you. I pray that your love will keep on growing more and more together with true knowledge and perfect judgment. And again, that's the agape love that he's talking about. So step four is that constant use is necessary to develop this discernment into a fine skill. What have we learned so far? As I draw to a close, if we're willing to ask for discernment, if we're willing to study what God's will is, if we're willing to ask for the Holy Spirit, and if we're willing to continue to exercise good judgment and discernment on a daily basis, then God takes great delight in that, great delight. Those are the four steps that I found outlined in the Bible. What is the result? Again, with spiritual discernment, we can see deeper into relational matters, deeper than people that don't have that discernment, than just on surface issues. We can gain the ability to see what are the true realities in life, past so much of the fluff and the fanfare and the glitter uh, of life around us. We become capable of making many more right choices in life. We become more successful in the important things, the priorities in life, relationship building things like how to love God and how to love our fellow human beings. And so again, finally on this topic, there is one more aspect of discernment which I'll draw to a close with that God uses toward us. He uses discernment toward us. In that God is a discerner, his word, I'm sorry, is a discerner of our hearts. Where our hearts are at any given time, his word of truth is a discerner to our hearts. If you still have your page uh, or Hebrews open, I'm going to come over to Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. You see, God's word helps us to... Um, helped us to gain discernment, but also God uses it himself to cut down into the heart and core of what is going on in our heart. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Here he starts, the author starts by talking about how God wants us to judge ourselves. This is part of spiritual maturity, so that God doesn't have to judge us. He doesn't have to correct us and chastise us as we grow in maturity. Our heart can either assure us before God or condemn us before God. Verse 12, 
For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden or creation hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So God's word is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the human heart. What is going on deep inside as far as motivation and uh, thoughts, plans, ideas. Verse 12, the NIV puts it this way. The word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It is true that God searches the heart and knows the thoughts. But that is not the truth which is prominent here. It just says that God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's that the thoughts and intents of the heart are brought to view by the word of God. This is what is being said here. To conclude today in this message, just like learning survival skills in the physical realm, when we're in trouble, in a crisis, lost, in danger, developing discernment is a spiritual survival skill for life. To close, the four steps were to acquire discernment comes by asking in prayer. Step two was to search out and learn the will of God. Step three was to ask for the Holy Spirit. Step four, it requires constant exercise and use to develop into a skill. And with that, I plan to bring a part two on discernment at a later time to share more on this very interesting topic.